What's up, hustlers? It's Andrew Morgans, your host here, founder of Marknology. Uh, got a great guest today. Uh, Jesse Rag is with us all the way from Germany. Jesse, say hello. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super stoked to have you on the show today. We're going to talk a little bit more about your business and a little bit more about yourself as well. We really like to cover um, the entrepreneur behind the business and not just, you know, the services and things like that. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, you know, Jesse was introduced to me. We got on a call before the show to just kind of talk about, um, you know, what we're going to cover today and e chameleon and, and all the services that it provides. And I think it's a really awesome tool. It's going to be able to help some of our listeners um, and, you know, give you a little exposure, but really talk about the needs that e commerce has and kind of why you got into this space. Uh, before we dig into it, let's give a shout out to our sponsor for today's episode uh, Fullscale.io, helping you build software teams quickly and affordably. If you're looking to scale your software team, uh, Fullscale.io is where you should start. Jesse, uh, I'd like to start the show off just getting to know you a little bit better. So, uh, you know, um, I feel like we're around the same age. Uh, tell me a little bit how you got into e-commerce and kind of your path to, uh, you know, becoming a founder of e-chameleon. But, but even before that, how you, um, you know, kind of discovered e-commerce and got into the space. You know, if I'm completely honest, I landed in e-commerce when I, when I first had an interview at my first e-commerce job. I had to Google what e-commerce was. I'd never heard of it. I landed in a foreign country in Germany. So I'm from the UK originally, but I landed in Germany. Uh, I didn't speak any German at all. And I had some sales background. I used to sell real estate when I was living in Australia. And I got to Leipzig with not much money looking for any kind of work. And I just was like, okay, I'm English and I can sell stuff. That's about it. I didn't go to university or anything. So I'm like, I'm pretty limited here. I'll take what I can get. And I Googled uh, English sales Leipzig and I landed in a really cool company called Intercultural Elements, who is basically in, uh, one of the first agencies specialized in helping brands and retailers expand internationally via marketplaces. Okay. Um, so they were like, they were founded in 2007 and I got a gig there heading up the sales team and that was sort of my first foray into e-commerce. So this was 2015, um, you know, it's not, actually that long ago but i guess it's you know a long time in, in e-commerce years mm -hmm. and um yeah so since then i i worked well, there. Well, i want to interrupt you just a little yeah. bit so um you're from the uk right mm -hmm. now you're in germany um but you were in australia okay yes. let's let, like this is the mindset <laughs> i think and uh is just as important as anything else let's back up just a little bit because i think it's fun um, and I found e-commerce because I was running from something else. I, I hated uh, uh, security and networking. And so I was just literally out there just trying to find anything that was different than that. When I came across e-commerce, it was like, I like computers. I'm good at them. My degree's in this. But I hate networking and security. Um, and e-commerce for me as well, you, I guess before I knew, and you said you had to Google it, before I knew exactly what it was, I didn't know that it could be something that you know provided freedom geographically for me where I could travel and different things like that. And I know some of your background, so I'd like to get into that just a little bit. You're from the UK. What, what brought you to Australia and what, what, how old were you probably at that time? Uh, I was 18. I walked out of my final exam at school and it was pouring down with rain because you know, England. Mm -hmm. And I just said to my mate, I was walking along and I said to my mate, oh, sod this, I'm, I'm moving to Australia jokingly. And a, a guy tapped me on the shoulder and it was my housemaster from, from my school. And he's like, you know, if you want to go to Australia, we have a gap program with our partner school in Australia. And the guy that was supposed to be going is just pulled out, but you'd need to be there next Friday. And yeah, so a week later I landed in Sydney and <laughs> um, yeah, I carried on basically. I, I was working there. First of all, I was working at a school just sort of, working in a boarding house, um, right. helping kids that were like 11 to 16 years old, um, kind of most of them were sort of just shipped off by parents to live in this sort of rural part of New South Wales. And I worked there for nine months or so. And then at the end of that, I moved to Canberra, which is uh, the capital and eventually sort of bounced around a few different things, working in bars. And cause I, I grew up living in pubs. Uh, my parents yeah. run pubs around the UK. Um, so I was working in bars because it was what I knew. And then I started selling 
I started doing like some direct sales, like standing on the street corner, like peddling raffle tickets to people and just, you know, this like, hey guys, I'm just buying an avocado here. I don't want to buy a hundred bucks worth of raffle tickets. And um, that was my first foray into sales. And then I sold a hundred bucks worth of raffle tickets to a guy who was just like, hey, I don't know how you did that, but I'm opening a real estate agency. Do you want to come and give me a hand? And then I ended up in real estate. And I love I that. <laughs> so, so were you a senior? Like, I know the school, the school system is a little bit different. So you said you're finishing up your final and then you had like a, you know, um, I'm sure it's a studying abroad kind of program or whatever. Um, did you continue school in Australia or it was uh, just kind of a work internship type thing? Yeah. So it was basically a working internship is a generous term. I, I think it was more like slave labor, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, it was, um, it was basically an unpaid internship. Um, you know, food and board and stuff was paid for. So I had a roof over my head and, and food, but I, because it was so spontaneous, I, I didn't have any savings to get me there. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think I had about 200 bucks every fortnight was what I was being paid, um, which sounds like a, a lot for an 18 year old, but realistically it was just, um, it was barely enough to pay for beers and <laughs> but, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Australia is expensive. No, but I, yeah, I, it's, it's, I, and you just decided to stay. I think it, I think it's a senior. I must've been a senior because most of my friends, everyone else then sort of went off to us, went off to university or, you know, started entering the workforce. Um, which was my plan. I was only going to go for a year. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to come back and, you know, I wanted to go to university and sort of follow the the path that everyone sort of sets mm -hmm. out. And then I, yeah, ended up staying for five years. No, I love that. And I think that getting to kind of, uh, I like to get to the little bit of the gritty, you know, behind the story. And um, I just read the book. I just took a road trip and was listening to the book Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. He's an actor here and he's writing some of his, uh, you know, his early life story. Mm -hmm. And uh, a big part of his was going to Australia and uh, he's staying with a family and different things. And uh, it's funny. It's a funny chapter where um, he's staying with a super strange family out in the sticks somewhere, like, you know, really far away. He thought he was going to Sydney and ended up staying just like in the boonies somewhere. Same here, um, man. <laughs> yeah, like it was, uh, you know, you, you have this picture of the beach and, you know, but really when you get over there, it's not like that. Um, so, no, that was really cool. We, you know, we talked about... Um, Sprinter vans too, and I, I want to bring that up because you know this this is a podcast. I cover e-commerce, but we cover all of entrepreneurship, you know. Yep. And uh, we've got a Sprinter van, a Mercedes Sprinter van, in the family that we're thinking about, you know, renovating or or selling off or doing something with it, so it's not just sitting around. Um, you said that you rented several of those. Those are really popular where I'm at right mm -hmm. now here in the Midwest and, and during the pandemic, people being able to just get out and be out and be in a safe space for themselves. Um, you said you rented three of those. I don't know anyone that has really. So <laughs> talk to me about that. So this was, this was actually in Australia as well. So this, uh, and it was, it wasn't three at the same time. It was one after the other and it was, uh, all sorts of different sizes. So, you know, we had like a, one sort of mid-size, I say mid-size, I mean, by American standards, it was tiny, you know, it mm -hmm. was like a, a sort of a small Chrysler people carrier sort of thing, but the guys had converted it into a little caravan and it was enough for me and my girlfriend at the time to, we, we flew up to Cairns in, in the Pacific, um, in the far north of Queensland, and we drove that all the way down to Sydney. So the whole East Coast, I think that took us a good couple of months to do properly um and you know we're living in this caravan and or in this in this tiny little um soccer mom wagon basically and then we we stopped in sydney and then we picked up a flight down to tasmania which is the little island off the bottom of australia and we then rented another vehicle there which was actually even smaller again um you know this thing was this thing we had to fold the back seats down to lay the mattress out and, and stuff like that. And it didn't even have a kitchen. So then we did about two and a half weeks traveling around Tasmania. Um, and then we flew from Tasmania up to Darwin, which is in the far north of, um, in the Northern Territory. And then we picked up another vehicle and we drove that all the way through the outback, through the middle of Australia into Adelaide. Um, that's and incredible. Then there, that's it. Yeah. And then there we picked up, uh, we flew from there to Perth, picked something else up. Um, and then we drove sort of south 
into the far southwest of Western Australia, and then we turned around and went all the way back up to the uh, back up north along the west coast, and then we flew back down to Perth, and then we left there and went to Southeast Asia. Sounds like a real entrepreneur to me. Just like go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> if you Instagram that, I think you'd be viral by now. Uh, <laughs> Probably you know, should have. Yeah. We didn't know it was so cool. Uh, you know, <laughs> to be living in. I I used to be in a band. Uh, through college and uh, okay. probably 2007 to 2011 really was about the time. And, uh, you know, we, we call it slaying the tour dragon, but everybody just wants to tour, you know, and that's how you get your band made. And, um, you know, you play shows and you're getting out of state and you're getting people to know you kind of before Spotify and YouTube and all these ways to be discovered. Yeah. It was touring and it was five or six of us in a, you know, 12 passenger van, you know, uh, it wasn't sexy, uh, and it smelled and, you know, um, but we were doing life in a van and, you know, with this trend going off, uh, you know, people wanting to be mobile and work remote and, and, you know, live in a van and be minimalistic. I just remember those days, of like, you know, sleeping in the yeah. van and, uh, it wasn't glorious. So I know you're working on, you're working on one now yourself. You said you spent the holidays in Germany, didn't get to go back home to the UK. Yeah. Um, you know, you're working on a van now and renovating it yourself. Yeah, I am. Yeah, uh, a transit actually, not a not a sprinter, but um, quite quite a small one. Um, or it's it's short, but it's it's tall, so I can stand up in it, but I can still park it like a normal car. Um, so that's good. But yeah, I'm I'm hoping to be in a position that you know the next next time we have a, another podcast in maybe six months time or so that I'll be sitting on some cliffside in in Norway or a beach in Greece or something like that. Or I can you're just you're going to have to stay on my radar. And if I don't reach out, you say, Hey, I'm in the van and I'd love to get on the show and uh, <laughs> we'll make it a visual for people. I think that would be really cool. Absolutely. Happy to. Um, okay. So thanks for that background. I just think it's a lot of fun to get to know, um, you know, the person behind the business a little bit and kind of know, you know, some of their history. And I think we have a lot of, like a lot of entrepreneurs have a lot of things in common, uh, whether it's the business idea or not, whether it's e-commerce or not. Um, we kind of have these just like mindsets and, and ways of going about things or jumping into things before we know exactly what's going on. That's yeah. unlike a lot of other people. <laughs> You know, um, and I think that's kind of what what brings a lot of entrepreneurs together. Um, okay, so uh, you are in Australia. What gets you to Germany? Uh, my ex. <laughs> okay, I'm, a relationship. A, I started. Uh, I started sort of. I think I woke up one morning. I was about twenty three, and I'm an only only child as well, so I haven't got any siblings. And I was just like, you know what? One one of these days, I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna have a phone call from a family member that I'm going to have to go home and I'm going to be on the other side of the world. And my, one of my parents is going to be alone or whatever. And I'm going to be 48 hours away door to door. So as nice as this is, I should start thinking about maybe one day going back to Europe. If I'm going to look at longer term plans, um, wasn't necessarily thinking next week, next month, you know, maybe just like in five years, as opposed to let's put down some roots and have a family and stuff in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I sort of made that decision that at some point I'm going to go back to Europe. And I was going through this process of like, okay, well, I don't really want to go back to the UK because I don't like the UK that much it, politically from the weather, from the, the people. It's just not really, it doesn't really match who I am. And so I then started thinking about, you know, where am I going to go? Where would I want to live? You know, what do I want to go to Sweden, you know, the happiest country on earth, or would I want to go to Greece? And, you know, the people are way too chilled for my, mm -hmm. for who I am, but at least it's a cool place geographically. Um, or Germany, you know, where everything's very efficient and, and um, it works properly, but maybe a little bit too, in, you know, maybe a little bit boring. Mm -hmm. And I was just sort of, but, you know, this is all sort of in the space of about 10 minutes of me waking up. Um, and yeah, that night I went out to a Halloween party and I met a group of Germans and I attempted to speak German to them because I'd had a bunch of beers. And, you know, when you, that is one advantage of drinking alcohol is that you become fluent in German. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it worked. And I, we ended up uh, getting on really well and we were together for about five years. Um, and yeah, in the end it, it did fizzle out, but I ended up staying in Germany because um, it is a cool place to live. It's a yeah. really, nice, really nice country to live in. I uh, 
people of the you know listeners of the podcast know some of my background but i grew up in africa till i was about 16 and um lived in some some time in moscow uh born in montreal so i'm french canadian by birth um but you know american citizen so i'm a dual citizen so just you know I, when you someone says where are you from i have a hard time answering because yeah. i feel like you know i'm from around and uh i always find it interesting um when coming back to Kansas City as someone that travels Kansas City, Missouri, here in the middle of you know the country, why do I choose this place to you know pack my back or like you know set my bags down and, yeah. and put up roots? Um, and you know it's because I, I'm so in love with the rest of the world. In Africa, it was uh, it was kind of like yesterday here in the U.S. You know, it was very um, traumatic at times. The government was uh, you know like a mess. Uh, it was dangerous and leaving uh congo at 16 i was very traumatized and um you know just a dangerous place and i want to be somewhere safe and like the midwest and in in the united states is a pretty safe place in general mm -hmm. uh and um it wasn't until maybe four years ago i think uh my older sister um we had been a apart for about eight years she uh moved back to kansas city to help me with my business marketology and, and help me build it and uh we one night is 1 a.m. She sent me a Facebook message and said, hey, there's tickets to Berlin for three hundred and twenty seven dollars. Uh, let's get two." And I hadn't traveled. Uh, I just been grinding, like whether it was the, sh the band or like, you know, you get two weeks vacation at a corporate job. I was an e-commerce manager, but I had like two weeks vacation. I'm going to see mom, you know, those two weeks. Yeah. And uh, this is the first time I, someone had pushed me, uh, you know, to, to travel again. I had just been kind of in my head going international and uh, pick Berlin randomly. We go because of the price and we can afford it. And I just had the absolute best time in Berlin. And uh, it was just uh, the last four years I've been just packed with travel. Uh, I've been all over the world, but it was Berlin that kind of reawakened that for me, reawakened that in me. I felt like people were just, uh, you know, authentically themselves there. Um, you know, they embrace that freedom aspect that they've been given. Um, you know, and, and it didn't hurt that my experience was also like I went to uh, rent a little like VW, like a little small bug car. Yeah. And uh, they upgraded me to a Range Rover with like four kilometers on it. So it was brand new. And I got to wow. drive it all over Germany for two weeks. It was incredible, you know. Uh, so I was feeling myself. I know that's more common there. But here in the Midwest, you know, it's, it's a, a pricey car. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just I fell in love with Germany. I've been waiting to get back. Um, I have so many places to go, but I can see why you stayed, you know, uh, I can see why you stayed and it seems like they're a pretty, um, you know, advanced culture as far as like Europe goes. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of the countries kind of stay in the past a little bit. Uh, they really embrace their past and their culture and their history. And, you know, I love all those things about it. Um, like you said, Greece, a little bit laid back, you know, Great. Italy, a little bit laid back. Germany didn't feel that way to me. It felt, uh, you know, it felt forward. It felt um, organized, I guess, like you said, systemized. Um, yeah. So you're in, you're in Germany. Um, you're in Germany. You don't know about e-commerce, you know about sales, and we all know e-commerce is just digital sales, right? Mm -hmm. And you said you you uh, worked in pubs. Were you like a bartender or a, a, that's what we call it here, a bartender, you know? That's where um, I learned sales, I think, is, uh, you know, I bartended for six years through college in the band stuff. So I was learning how to talk to people, um, you know, things like that that I later helped me as a founder. Yeah, so sort of. So, I mean, yeah, I worked as a bartender as well. Um, I mean, so my parents, uh, uh they ran very 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 traditional english pubs so if you okay. imagine the quintessential british village pub they that's basically where i grew up so we the the house that i grew up in was built in the early 15th cent or 1501 1502 or something like this um you know there's, there's records in our village we we had to close for renovations a couple of years ago and it was the first time in 900 years that our village had had no oh alcohol. my god okay I haven't, I haven't been to i haven't been to england so forgive me it's on my no, list so it's, I, it's, I haven't been to a traditional pub like that so it's it's a very different um i've never seen it anywhere else in the world so it's hard to say like it's you know it was a bartender or like totally i work behind the bar but then you also you work as a waiter you work as a one -stop um, shop. all all sorts of stuff but your your point is 100 percent right you know and i think everybody should work in hospitality at some point in their life you know especially people who say they don't like dealing with people they're the ones that should absolutely be doing it because it's where you learn 
what I think are some of the biggest life skills, you know, if you can't, you know, talking to people. You, you know, I remember, and I was fortunate that I grew up in this environment, but the guy that taught me to tie my shoelaces when I was, you know, however old I was when I learned to tie my shoelaces, he was just this old man that would come in every day and he'd sit in the corner and have his cheese sandwich and a pint of IPA. And, you know, I would just be talking to him and he told me all sorts of stuff about his life and, you know, his time in the army and all this sort of stuff. And he taught me how to tie my shoelaces. And I think that pissed my dad off a bit, but still it was... <laughs> You know, it's uh, those sorts of experiences growing up. I I wouldn't be who I am without that. No, um, that's really good. And and you're not, you can't expect those relationships, you know, that come from that. But you just start learning. Like you get a perspective that new people, new um, relationships, you know, um, can bring about good things. You know, like, you, you know, there's good people out there that you can meet randomly that can just uh, bring a little spice to your life. And maybe they're just there for a day, but you know, it can make your day or, uh, or break it, you know. Um, but I have plenty of uh, patrons that I can think of just like you, whether it was uh, the music writer of the Kansas City Star, he was always the one going to all the shows and he'd come in and sit at my bar and have a drink. We'd talk about the shows he was at, you know, or um, the army recruiters that tried to get me every day. You know, I have these yeah. memories of just like, you know, people that came in and um, I wasn't talking to the military guys the same way I was talking to, you know, the the writer, the music writer. And it just gives you a, um, a broad range of, of people skills. And yeah. I, you know, that's something that um, I've kind of noticed a lot of people that are good at sales or that find themselves in sales have some kind of background in, in hospitality. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the only downside to it, if I'm completely honest with myself, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this, but something that I've noticed about myself recently is that it means that I'm so adaptable that I often find myself wondering who I actually am. Almost you know, like you, a chameleon. Yeah, 100%. You know, really. It, <laughs> um, and I like the plug, but you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's a big, it's a big thing where I'm just like, you know, so in this group of people, I'm that person and they all see me as that person, but am I then the same person when I go to that other group of people or if I'm having a conversation with a different person and then who am I actually? And, you know, I think it, and nobody, I think really knows who they are. And if they do, then congrats, because it's a, it's a big question. But I think that's one downside is when you are good at talking to lots of different types of people, that you do then run that risk perhaps maybe i'm wrong but no i think that's i think that's good awareness uh, let's talk about that a little bit but uh, i'm 34 i just had a birthday on the 30th um thank you uh so it's i'm getting used to saying 34 um but you're you're exactly right and it's you know just like the entrepreneurial process right like uh it's a it's a cliche saying but it's like don't fall in love with the goal or you know the uh but fall in love with the process mm -hmm. And the process of doing it. And I think that's the same with getting to know ourselves. Um, you know, I've realized that year seven um, with Marknology and, you know, time before that, it's been, uh, it took me hitting rock bottom in my 20s uh, to figure out, to, to become self aware, to start thinking about who am I and, and what do I stand for and what do I want to be known for and what legacy do I want to leave behind. And it's been a six, seven year journey of that you know things like i have to put myself in different situations to know who i am in those situations and get get to know myself a little bit better and uh you know i think that i become a better businessman um you know a better consultant a better advisor um a better friend a better leader a better boss all those things if i'm getting to know who i am right and uh i think there is a when you're an entrepreneur you're all in and uh, it can be hard to know exactly who you are, but I think it's okay. It's it's a strength. And so it's not something that you have to apologize for or feel like you're changing. Uh, it's merely those are all different sides of you, uh, but there is a core in the middle, right? And so it, it's okay to be an athlete. And then, you know, I can go play basketball or uh, football, probably as you guys play, uh, you know, or, and I'm good and I, you know, compete and I'm, I'm there. Uh, I can be at the gun range. I can be traveling and, you know, reading books, or I can be talking to you tech about e-commerce and programming and backend, uh, you know, backend stuff. So those are all aspects of me, um, you know, and they're completely unrelated to each other. And I think that can be the same thing with people, um, 
you know, for me, I've been lucky to always just have family, uh, you know, my sister right by my side. And as I'm trying to learn a lot of these business principles, uh, she's always kind of pulling me back to center, you know, and, and if I'm trying to learn how to be a little bit more articulate uh, or a little bit more um, posh or polished or, you know, wear a suit or wear dress clothes or, you know, for this big meeting or something like that. She's always there reminding me like, you know, people like you for who you are. Um, and that's, you know, that's your magic. So, so stay Andrew. So, you know, you got to have those people in your corner that bring you home if you're getting a little bit off base. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that, uh, it's a process and, and, um, so don't fear it more so embrace it. If that makes yeah. sense. Uh, and, and, uh, as someone going through it right now, I mean, uh, I'm working on, um, you know, finding that inner, that center for me as well, because, uh, in the business world, you know, if you have emotions and things like that, it can be volatile, right? It can be, uh, you know, you take uh, rejections, you take losses, you take bad days. Um, and if you take them too seriously, because you're trying to be like, you know, the feely Andrew, uh, it's really, really hard, you know, but if I'm too cold shouldered or I'm too cut off um, on the other end, like on the personal side, then it makes business super hard. So it's yeah. like, it's this kind of balance of, uh, as an entrepreneur, finding that center, finding like who's me, um, as someone that grew up in Montreal, in Africa, in Kansas City, in Moscow, I've changed for a lot of people as well, you know, to kind of fit in and and just like, you know, relate to people. Um, and now I'm in my 30s and, and I'm still figuring it out. So yep. um, I, I love this topic, honestly. So you, you brought yeah. something up that's very <laughs> close to me. Um, because the more authentically I am myself, I think, uh, you know, the closer I am to, uh, you know, being the man I want to be. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really, it's a really good answer. Actually, that's no, so thank you. <laughs> no, yeah, I just think I encourage you to just embrace that as someone that's a hybrid myself and, and can fit in with all types of people. Um, it can be a little bit of imposter syndrome or insecurity <laughs> around different types of people, you know, um, but that's the, that's the value that only Jesse or Andrew can bring to the table, you know, is being absolutely. that person that's, uh, you know, and that's why we can build awesome stuff for other people. Let's, let's merge into that a little bit is like yeah. uh, being able to think like other people, being able to think about their needs because we know how to relate to people, um, you know, being able to speak to them about what we're selling and, and why we believe in it. Uh, the, you know, those are our strengths. Um, let's talk about eChameleon. You know, I, uh, we, we've talked a little bit about the background. Um, yeah. you know, you're in Australia. We talked a little bit about how you got into e-commerce. You, you took a job at a gig you didn't even know was e-commerce and it was helping brands expand internationally across different marketplaces and things yes. like that. Um, but that's not eChameleon. So let's pick it up there and, and, and what happened next? So, well, so it's sort of where eChameleon started. So to talk about the, the company that I was at, they they had this really good solution. The team that were there, they're real experts. You know, there were people that had been working in e-commerce for ten years. Um, you know, when I or you know eight years when I started, um, they've worked with every category, every marketplace. And you know, this is where in the, when it then starts getting really interesting. Is it's not just Amazon. You know, they were helping like a UK retailer would be doing really well on Amazon and eBay in the UK, and then they'd be like, okay, cool, what's next? Well, let's go to France and Germany. Let's go on Amazon and eBay because they're there. But then let's also go on to see discount because that's the biggest French owned marketplace. And then let's go on to Real and Otto and Zalando and About You. And, you know, there'd be this long list of marketplaces that we could put people on. And we had real genuine expertise in house because it was not software based. It was human beings who did this day in, day out, 40 hours a week for everyone in every category in every different marketplace and they were native speakers so if you had a british retailer wanting to sell on a german marketplace in some really obscure category they had a really experienced account manager from germany who would who's done it a hundred times before and that value was what we were selling so it was a really easy sell and and you know the the business is still there and if, if somebody listening wants a good handhold approach um intercultural elements i mean they're fantastic at what they do uh, and they've been doing it since 2007 so it's well worth um sort of exploring it but what what i realized or what we what we all realized when we were there is that we were losing probably 80 percent of the conversations that we were having um as leads they weren't converting because people didn't want to they either didn't want to pay for an agency because it was too expensive um or that you know the roi wasn't there or there wasn't maybe enough evidence that there would be roi um and then also 
a lot of people didn't want to outsource. They wanted a solution they could have and hold themselves and, and bring something in house that they could just give to their employees and say, hey, look, here's a great resource. We're going to get all these results that I just spoke about. We're going to sell on all these marketplaces, but you guys are going to do it. And obviously it doesn't exist. You know, there's there's businesses out there like uh, Channel Advisor and, and um, you know, there's, there's tons of different technologies. Uh, they're all good in their own ways, but the fundamental problem that they have is that if you don't know how the marketplaces tick, it doesn't matter how good the integration is that can put your products on the marketplace. Um, you're preaching, and, you're preaching Marknology right now. You know, well, that's it's, exactly uh, it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you guys, I've, I, um, I only came across Marknology, you know, when we first met, and it's it's a very similar sort of pitch. You know, it's it's technology only gets you so far. You've got mm -hmm. to actually have an understanding of the marketplaces, and I think that's where you guys also do a really good job, from what I've seen. Um, we specialize in Amazon mainly, you know, of the marketplaces. Yeah. So not all of them, um, but we do have some people in on eBay and Walmart and Chewy and you know things like that. Um, but yeah, it's exactly that. It's the software does at least in our experience, you know, um, it's either pricey um, or it's you know it's an outsourced thing. Uh, you know, you're using somebody else's. It's not in house, mm -hmm. um, and those are major issues. Like you know, I've got. Uh, there's a lot of clients I can't serve because they either can't afford a team that spends 40 hours a week, you know, obsessing about these for the last seven years mm -hmm. um, that, you know, they can't afford that expertise um, or they don't understand the ROI. So exactly what you're saying is, um, you know, maybe I need to come out with e-chameleon. Keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, basically what e-chameleon is, is uh, it's all of that expertise that I just spoke about from, from, from intercultural elements. So, the software itself started life as an internal solution at intercultural elements. So okay. all of those people that I was talking about, the, the German, the French, the Italian, the Spanish account managers that have been doing this work over the years, they've been using earlier versions of eChameleon. You know, it started life as Excel sheets. We were doing lookup lists. We were building, um, you know, big access databases that would take you know an amazon browse tree node from the uk and what's the most relevant amazon browse tree node in germany and you know we had that we had that lookup list built probably five six years before amazon brought out their equivalent in europe um and again it was just a case of okay how do we make it easy to do this work for our customers so that we can be as efficient as we can and then eventually it got to a point where we realized that the software that we were using was really valuable you know we're like mm -hmm. okay this is this is something that's good we, sh we should be selling this um but obviously having a software company and a service company which basically offer the same thing um and they're two very different beasts you know running a service running a service agency as you would know is very different to running a SaaS company um mm -hmm. and so what we what my business partner edward he's one of the founders at intercultural elements um he and i uh founded e chameleon we pulled in some external investors to help us purchase the software from Intercultural Elements. And we basically picked it up and we've spent most of the last year redeveloping, basically taking all of this internal software that is good, but you need to have sort of been in there and learned how to use it and everything. Um, and we've repackaged it into a solution that anyone can kind of pick up and run with. Um, of course, you know, as with every software, you still have to learn how to use it. It's right. You know, it's it's not just drag and drop and you're magically selling on a hundred marketplaces. But the idea is is that it's one process for every single marketplace. So what we do is we get people to sort of learn how e chameleon works to do the same thing that they're doing anyway. So, you know, your your team at Marknology, like let's say you want to start selling. Sorry, not to turn this into a sales pitch, but let's know. say you've got sellers that are working really well on Amazon and they're going, Hey, I want to be on Walmart, but your team maybe don't, and I don't know, but maybe your team don't know how Walmart works as well as Amazon. So what we do is we show you how to use eChameleon to do the same thing that you do in Amazon. And then you learn eChameleon in that process. And then, Hey, presto, you now also know how to work on Walmart and on eBay and on Chewy and on all the other marketplaces that we've got integrated. So, now you put an international spin on this. Let's say you go and get your listings professionally translated for Amazon Germany. Well, that's great. But what about Real, Otto, Zalando, Wonder Curves, 
all these other sort of niche marketplaces that are great for different categories, we then start looking at building rules and systems in place that you can just automate the whole process. So you can say, right, here's my key 10 pieces of information about this particular product. I'm going to build a whole bunch of rules that will just bring this into all the different marketplaces. So if it's if this marketplace wants XXL as my size, and this marketplace wants 2XL as my size, and this marketplace wants small, medium, large, and there's nothing above or below that, you can build rules that help you to sort of categorize all of this and to automate the whole flow without losing on the quality. Because that's the other side of software is, you know, as soon as you start automating stuff, you do run the risk of losing quality. So we really try to factor that in and try to have the balance of that. Um, but yeah, that's good. No, in, time, uh, so. <laughs> no, no, no. And then this is a great spot. You know, if you're, if you're listening to today's show and, uh, you're trying to build a software like Ecamillion, or you're trying to develop some stuff in house or add it to what you already do, full scale IO, our, our sponsor for today's episode is exactly that, you know, find a, an exact programmer that can help you do exactly what you're trying to do. Um, you know, and build your team out. And, uh, you know, I, I think at, at one time, uh, might get into development, but it's a long way off. I don't really um, have any desire to build a software as a service, you know, platform. And um, I'd rather just perfect the service side, you know, and then and then partner with the good ones. <laughs> so um, I still think it's in our future that, uh, you know, we have our brands, one of our technology brands and, um, you know, and run with eChameleon. Uh, e um, and see what we can learn and see how it fits. You know, we're we're always trying to find good partners, um, whether it's in the in the EU or um, you know abroad. I, I've been trying to find a, a good partners for. It's quite the process for anyone listening to take products, uh, you know, list them in the EU on Amazon, which is continuing to add more markets. I think Poland just launched. Um, and how do you translate them? How do you push them? How do you know what be in, uh, you know, when you're using Google Translate to understand yeah. different things and, um, you know, finding the right partner to translate. And um, it really is a lot like e-commerce is a simple thing for the users. I think that's why so many people are moving to e-commerce to buy things. But on the back end, it can be, um, you know, really complicated to learn 20 different marketplaces or 20 different ways of selling. And they all have a little bit of different nuances between them. Absolutely. But I think there's there's two really important things to think about because a lot of people sort of go, well, why bother? Um, you know, why should I sell on more than just Amazon? And, and I know that, you know, Amazon's, of course, it's a great place to be selling your products. You know, there's a reason it's the largest marketplace in the Western world. Um, you know, it, it's it's a no brainer. But I think the thing that I'm constantly preaching is that people shouldn't become too reliant on it. I have so many conversations with people who have had an account suspended for every for every reason under the sun. Um, and suddenly they've gone from a point where their business, which was, you know, maybe bringing in millions of dollars a year in turnover from Amazon, has suddenly just disappeared. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if Amazon is 80, 90 percent of your revenue, that's it. Business is closed because it's going to take days or weeks to get that appeal. And even if your appeal is then successful, and your account is shut down for three, four weeks, and that's money just sitting there, and then you can't get it out in time to pay your employees. That's it. It's right. done. I, um, I think. I think if I had to say, use the word preach, you know, just to be on the same page, um, you know, I preach prioritization. You know, and so you know, if a brand's like, "What do I focus on? What should I do?" I'm I'm Amazon, mm -hmm. right? It's Amazon. Amazon has the biggest potential to start getting you revenue, to start you know growing your business, to start helping you understand e-commerce. It makes it easiest. Um, but after that, diversification. You know, and if you're a, you're looking at Chewy, if you're a furniture brand, you're looking at Wayfair. If you're a food brand, you're looking at Instacart or you know different things like that. I think that there's there's these smaller marketplaces that. Um, are great for specific types of products. And, and um, I've seen that across the board. So, you know, definitely validating what you're saying in regards to diversification. Uh, you know, I personally, um, me and my team have handled hundreds of suspensions. Um, and that's a very real thing and a very stressful thing um any other areas um you know that can either keep you going until you get it you know unsuspended or um you know you put your focus there while you're working on those kinds of things um it goes a long way and i do think that those um 
Amazon's almost set the the bar for a lot of those marketplaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the last few years, we've really seen them step up. You know, even Walmart is is emulating Amazon, and um, you know, eBay is trying to make enhancements and Etsy and different things like that. So um, it's a lot of them are getting a lot better than what's been there in the past. Absolutely, but I think that's also you know a really good point, and none of them do it well. You know, none of them make it easy. As you said, they make it easy for a consumer, but they don't make it easy for a seller. And I think this is where, you know, and really where we try and fix this problem is the inconsistency in the marketplace requirements. This is this is sort of what's at the core of what we do is, you know, let's say that you're selling on Amazon and you're selling women's shoes in France and you're selling a pair of silver shoes. Well, that's fine. eBay also lets you use silver. But if you're selling men's shoes, they're gray. Mm -hmm. And it's just that little difference in a valid value where if you then try to upload, you know, you can use any technology you want to actually try and list the product onto the marketplace. But if the valid value, how you're describing that product doesn't match what the marketplace actually wants to receive, you're just going to get a listing error. Right. And then to your point, prioritization. Well, of course, if you're if you get a hundred listing errors, of course you're going to fix the ones on Amazon first, because that's where you're going to get your sales. Mm -hmm. And then if you're on 50 other marketplaces and you're getting listing errors from all of them, why would you then change it? And why would you are you then going to have one column that says Amazon color and another column that says eBay color and another one that says C discount and Chewy and et cetera, et cetera. Your data becomes a mess. Everything just starts, you lose control. And then of course, something else gets changed because they're different, but they also change all the time. So you might change it to gray. And then two weeks later, actually they, um, eBay says, oh no, silver's fine. So then you're, then you're not list, you're not optimized. Right, exactly. Not optimized. That's the key word, I think, is you can be listed. And what's worse than even getting a listing error is your product going through, but it not being correct. You mm -hmm. know, so your product's there, you're live, you're like, why am I not getting any sales? Well, you might have made some some changes or something to get it to go through because you just simply wanted it to go through. But now it's not optimized. It's not ready to go. Um, and I think that's what the Marknology team, what we're stressing and what we're preaching is um, there's so many brands that want to do it the easy way. And that is just like get the product up. Um, and what they don't understand is that it has to be optimized. That is like, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's number one. Every marketplace has its own little quirks, um, its own little advantages or disadvantages. Um, what are those advantages or disadvantages? How do you optimize? You know, how do you optimize the ads? How do you optimize photography? How do you optimize, you know, as marketplace SEO? Um, and, and unless you've done that, unless you have someone in house that's been obsessing about it, unless you have like a dedicated team that's just studying all the changes on all these marketplaces, um, you know, you're just not going to be as successful as you could be. And, and you know, success in any e commerce, success in these marketplaces can be millions of dollars, right? So we're not just talking about, okay, we're doing e commerce, we're talking about millions of dollars, um, you know, on the table by just not paying attention to the right things. Absolutely right. Absolutely. And I think that's also the the big factor as well with a lot of people is that they, they and rightly so, they're not then going to go and try and figure out how to do that 100 times. Because it's it takes all that work just to do it for Amazon. And eBay is just as bad. And then, you know, there's, there's 100 things you can do with eBay to get every listing looking great, all the item specifics that you can add all of the eBay SEO. And, you know, a great a great guy to follow on LinkedIn is a guy called Dave Snyder. He's a real um, eBay SEO expert. He, he doesn't even begin to look at Amazon because it's not his thing. But mm -hmm. if you want to know how eBay algorithms work, the guy's a genius with it. Um, I but it's started, a entirely I, different topic. Yeah, I started on eBay. Um, they make it easier for the seller, right? You can mm -hmm. take pictures in your garage, you can do all types of things. And it's evolved a little bit. You know, the Buy It Now came out and, um, you know, they paved the way for e-commerce in a lot of ways. Um, it was all about the item specifics. Okay. That was like part of the SEO. Like, are you choosing the right item specifics? Um, in that item specific space, you have keywords that are relevant to the products and, um, you know, model numbers for car parts. And, you know, it was just all of these little like, um, quirks, you know, to mm -hmm. optimize. And, and what I did on eBay is, is not possible at all on Amazon. I've spent nine years uh, and I'm only 34. I spent nine years on Amazon and then there's still so much to learn because it's an evolving marketplace. Yeah. There's no way I can know everything about Chewy, everything about Etsy, everything about Wayfair, everything, you know, um, it's just impossible. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, you know, this is, this is really uh, our, our core 
and, and uh, yeah, so uh you know as we round it out as we round the show show out um you know a couple of questions one being um where can people find you uh i've got your website pulled up here mm -hmm. for anyone watching the video but for anyone in their cars um you know where can they they find yourself as well as e chameleon and then question number two um you know what what would what is uh something that e chameleon offers that you know some of these other aggregators uh do not, um, I think would be real insightful for anyone listening. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, in terms of where to find us, obviously ecomelion.com is is the first point of call. I personally am pretty active on LinkedIn, so you can always get me on there. And I'm I'm lucky that I don't have a really common name. So there's, as far as I know, only one of me um, on LinkedIn. If there's another Jesse Rag out there on LinkedIn, please also add me, It'd be great to meet you. Um, but yeah, so that's definitely the place to go to sort of find out a little bit more. In terms okay. of what we do differently, I think we've got two two key points of difference. The first is marketplace validation. As far as I know, we're the only company out there which actually has all of the requirements from the marketplaces that we've got integrated. So we don't. Our focus isn't necessarily just about getting listings onto the marketplaces. What we do instead is we pull the requirements from the marketplaces, so we know what they want from you, rather than helping you give them what you've got and then figuring out after the fact what went wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really our core that's specialization. That's big, actually. Like that's what that's what we're trying to do as humans. And I think what's what's a big part that's mess left out is um, there's bare necessities, you know, to get on. Uh, and then there's like, well, it's all about please, at least when it comes to Amazon, it's all about what does Amazon want? Let's give them what they want. And when we do that, that's when we're optimized. That's when Amazon starts giving us, um, you know, views and sessions and clicks and ultimately sales. Um, you know, it's getting all of those little checks, check boxes checked uh, along the way that Amazon wants. Um, no, it's good. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think just to mention it as well, the other thing that um, because I don't know how long this is going to be true for. So I'll mention it now. Um, mm -hmm. We're we're a young business, you know. We're we're not a corporate giant that needs six, twelve months of decision making to go down a particular path. Um, you know, we've made massive changes just off of a off of a passing comment from a prospect. You know, we had one a guy a few months back who was looking at the system and he's going, "Well, hey, you know, this is really cool, um, but every time I create a listing, I also have to create fifty variations." He basically sells carpets. So if you imagine he gets one new product in, but he has it in 50 different variations of length and width. They're always the same lengths and widths. But he needs to basically complete a couple of pieces of information about this product, but he has to do it 50 times. And it's where he loses the most time because every time he gets a new product, it's usually one of a couple of thousand. Mm -hmm. So what we did for him, I say for him, he's not signed up yet. We've done it because it was a really cool point. And we're like, this is a cool feature. We want to build this in. Um, we can now build parent ver parent child variation templates. Okay. So let's say you always have the same type of variations. You can save that as a template, and then you can just apply that template when you create a new listing, and suddenly you create all your variations at the same time based on that predetermined rule. So if your colors are, you know, if you've, you're selling T-shirts and they're always in small, medium, large, extra large, red, blue, white, green, and black, you can create all of those listings based on the rules that I talked about earlier with one click. And that's then when sort of automation doesn't necessarily lose control because it's based on rules that you've set in a way that the marketplace wants you to do it. It's just going to save you 95% of the time in creating the listing. And, I, love uh, I love it. And that's what, that's what e is about. You know, that's what the uh, software as a service is about is about saving you time and hours. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, letting your team focus on the stuff they need to and not the the tedious, um, you know, repeating something 50 copy times. And paste, copy thousand. and paste. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's exactly it. But no, yeah. so that's it, man. We try, we try and be, we're, we're, we're human beings here. You know, the, the team that's here have been working together for, you know, in some cases over a decade. Um, my business partner and I have been working together for more than five years. Um, and the team that are here, you know, when we do bring customers in, you know, we, we know that we're in a young business, right? So we know that we don't have a finished, polished product. We don't try and pretend anything otherwise. But if the customer comes in and they, they want to, they've got a goal in mind, we've got a great piece of software that has a great, very relevant end goal. And we've got a good team of people to help people put that together. Um, no, 
I love so it. A good combo. No, I love it. And as someone that's been in this space and kind of pioneering the Amazon space, I've seen a lot of softwares pop up and some of them were a lot of, a lot of them were in house, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that were helping e-commerce sellers grow in the early days. Um, and it really is just about having partners that are willing to take your insights. You're in the front lines, you're dealing with different changes and issues that happen and having a partner on the other side that's, that cares, uh, mm -hmm. number one, and that's, you know, willing to innovate and you innovate together and you grow together. And, and we've got some partners like that already on the Amazon side. Um, you know, whether it's email or returns or refunds or, you know, profitability tracking and um, the difference in having a partner that's, uh, you know, human on the other side and that listens to what you're, you have going on and is always trying to improve is, uh, is prices. I like to think so. Jesse, uh, next time I have you on the show, I hope you're in the van and we have a view and uh, good Wi-Fi. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll get you outside of that apartment. And uh, I think that'd be really fun for the show. Um, I know we're going to we're going to talk again soon, uh, whether we're working together with E-Chameleon or, or just an uh, entrepreneur, uh, whether I'm in uh, once we lift these travel bans, you know, I'm going to have to make it out there. So I uh, really Berlin, appreciate you being on the show. Way better than Berlin. Right. OK, OK. <laughs> I know, have you show me around. So uh, I, think, I think we'd have a great time. Cool. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's really nice to meet you again. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, we'll see you later, guys. Once again, shout out to our sponsor of today's episode, Fullscale.io, helping you build software teams quickly and affordably. We'll see you next time, guys.